Welcome to the Calculus Building. My name is Gregory Carlson. Let's do a little bit more limit practice just to make sure we totally understand what's going on. Classify the following statement as true or false. Is the limit of x approaches 6 of 7 equal to 6? Okay, let's be careful here. Let's really make sure we understand what's going on. The function in this case, f of x, is equal to 7. And as you know, the graph of a number, the graph of a constant, is just a horizontal line. In fact, this horizontal line is going through the value 7. So it's 7 everywhere, okay? So this graph is 7 everywhere, so is the limit as x approaches 6? Is that equal to 6? No, it's equal to 7. So this first statement is not true. What about the second statement? As you can see, we flipped the numbers around a little bit. Is the limit of 6 as x approaches 7 equal to 6? Well, this time our function is the number 6. Here our function was the number 7. So we've got the number 6 is our function. So it's 6 everywhere. And so as x approaches 7, is our limit equal to 6? And the answer is yes, because over here at 7, our limit approaches the same value in both directions, and that limit is equal to 6. So the second statement is true. In fact, x could approach any number here, and the limit would equal 6. What about this last one? The limit as x approaches 6 of 6, is that equal to 7? Well, these numbers match, but again, let's think about it. And you can see how I like to draw pictures, just to help me. So we're approaching 6, and our function is 6, which means our function is 6 everywhere. So can the limit ever equal 7? No. If the limit is equal to 6 every if, if the function is equal to 6 everywhere, the limit is never going to equal 7. So I hope that makes sense to you. Um, let's do a few more limit problems. Find the following limits. Now, as you know, the correct way to do this is to make a table around whatever value you're doing and then get close to it on one side and close to it on the other side and see if they both approach the same number. That's the right way to do it. In fact, that way, there's an even better way to do it, and I'll, I'll make that maybe a separate video called the Delta Epsilon method, but because you never know, even though you might be approaching it, maybe it hiccups at the last second. So how can you prove that it's never going to hiccup? Well, there's a way to do that, and it's called the Delta Epsilon method, which I'll make a separate video. But remember what I said, if it's a well-behaved function, and I haven't defined that yet, but if it's a well-behaved function like a line, a polynomial, you know, this one has an interesting thing happen to it, or a square root, those are pretty well-behaved. So if that's the case, you have my permission to just plug in the number and see what it is. So because we know 6x plus 1 is well-behaved, let's just plug in negative 1. So 6 times negative 1 plus 1 is going to equal negative 6 plus 1 is going to equal negative 5. So that's going to be the limit for this function. Uh, it's going to be negative 5 because this is a well-behaved function, and it turns out that f of negative 1 equals the limit. Same with this one. Let's plug in 1. Notice I'm putting it in parentheses. Uh, because you should do that in case there's a negative sign. So 5, 1 to any power is equal to 1, so that's just going to be 5 times 1 is 5, minus 7 plus 9. So 5 minus 7 is negative 2, negative 2 plus 9 is 7. So the limit as x approaches 1 of this function, 5x to the 5 minus 7x to the 4 plus 9, that limit is going to equal the value we got, which was negative 2 plus 9, which was 7. So that's acceptable because polynomials are generally well-behaved. An interesting thing happens on this example. So what is the limit as x approaches negative 3? Well, that's kind of a problem because if you look, if we plug in negative 3, we get negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. That's not defined. Anything divided by 0 is undefined. So what do we do? Well, there is a rule we're going to learn a little later called the Hopital's rule, but until we get there, 
watch something special happens with this. Do you notice that on the top we have a difference of squares? So if I factor that, I get x minus 3, x plus 3 on the top, and I have x plus 3 on the bottom. Isn't that interesting? In fact, x plus 3 will cancel with x plus 3. So this function is equal to x minus 3 everywhere except negative 3. Okay, this function is equal to x minus 3 ev everywhere except negative 3. And so what that means is I can go ahead and plug in my limit, plug in negative 3, and so we get negative 3 minus 3, which equals negative 6. So I just plugged in my limit right there. So that's a really special example. You are allowed to do that because remember, we don't care what the function is at negative 3. We don't care. We just care about what is it getting approach, what approaches, what the function approaches at negative three. And so since the function is equal to x minus three, because this cancels everywhere else, that means it's negative six. So really quickly, let's just look at what this function would look like on a graph. Everywhere except negative three, this function looks like the line x minus three. So the function goes up like that, it has a slope of 1, it comes down, at negative 3 we have a hold because the function is not defined at negative 3. But everywhere else it looks like the line x minus 3. So now it's easier to see that we have a limit there. Even though we don't have a point right here, the limit approaches negative 6 in both directions. And so that's why the limit does exist there at the negative 3. So that's a really important example to understand. That, by the way, is called a removable discontinuity. A removable discontinuity. Because uh, there's, we could remove the discontinuity by canceling. So this is a different function than this one. This one has a point that's undefined, whereas this one is defined everywhere. So that's a removable discontinuity. Finally, let's find the limit of the square root of 7x minus 1. Again, square roots are well behaved as long as the square root exists. So let's plug in 2. So that's going to equal the square root of 14 minus 1 because we had 7 times 2. So that equals the square root of 13. So the limit of this one is going to equal the square root of 13. Again, if you had a negative number in here and it was imaginary, then for our purposes, we're going to say the limit does not exist because in this class, we're only going to deal with the real number line. We're not going to look at the complex number line very much. All right, last problem in this video. Use the graph and the function to find the following. So here we've got this k of x function, which is bouncing all over the place. And I notice that we have a little hole right there on the graph. Uh, another removable discontinuity. What is the limit as x approaches 3? Well, here's 3 right here. Based on the graph, it appears that we're approaching the same thing from either direction, so I'm going to say that the answer to that is negative 1, because that's the y value right there. Find k of 3. Okay, what actual value does it take there? Um, the value is going to be nothing because we don't have a value right there. And so the value of that is not going to be defined. It's undefined. It does not exist. So you'll notice if there was a point here, like say there was a dot right there, then k of 3 would have equaled 5 if there had been a dot at 5, or it would have equaled negative 4 if there had been a dot at negative 4. But there's no value at that point on the function, so we just say that it's undefined or that it does not exist. So I, uh, the answer to the last question, is k continuous at x equal to 3? The answer is no. You can't be continuous if a point doesn't exist. And I'm going to explain what this word means in the next video. And uh, because continuous is a really important concept that I've been building up to. And so we're going to talk about it and see exactly what it means. But uh, essentially, you can't be continuous if you don't have a point there. 
So that's why this example would not be continuous. And I will see you in the next video where we talk about continuity, a very important topic in calculus. See you there.